Hi folks, hope you're okay today. I'm sharing an article by one of the great uh, theologians of all time and uh, one of my heroes of the faith, B.B. Warfield, The Formation of the Canon of the New Testament. Uh, so without further ado, published in 19, 1892, he says, in order to obtain a correct understanding of what is called the formation of the canon of the New Testament, it is necessary to begin by fixing very firmly in our minds one fact which is obvious enough when attention is once called to it. That is, that the Christian church did not require to form for itself the idea of a canon or as we should be more commonly called it, of a Bible. That is of a collection of books given of God to be authoritative rule of faith and practice. It inherited this idea from the Jewish church along with the thing itself, the Jewish scriptures or the canon of the Old Testament. The church did not grow up by natural law, it was founded. And the authoritative teachers sent forth by Christ to found his church carried with them as their most precious possession, a body of divine scriptures which they imposed on the church that they founded on its code of law. No reader of the New Testament can need proof of this, and every page of that book is spread the evidence that from the very beginning the Old Testament was as cordially recognized as law by the Christians as by the Jew. The Christian church thus, thus was never without a Bible or a canon. But the Old Testament books were not the only ones which the apostles, by Christ's own appointment, the authoritative founders of the church, imposed upon the infant churches as their authoritative rule, faith and practice. No more authority dwelt in the prophets of the Old Covenant than himself, the apostles, who had been made sufficient as ministers of a new covenant, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Or as one of themselves argued, if that which passeth away was with glory, much more that which remaineth is in glory, 2 Corinthians 3, 11. Accordingly, not only was the gospel they delivered in their own estimation itself a divine revelation, but it was also preached in, quote, the Holy Ghost, 1 Peter 1, 12. Not merely the matter of it, but the very words in which it was clothed were of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2, 13. Their own commands were therefore of divine authority, 1 Thessalonians 4, 2, and their writings were the depository of these commands, 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. If any man obeyeth not our our word by this epistle, says Paul to one church, 2 Thessalonians 3.14. Note that man that you have no company with him, end of quote. To another, he makes it the test of spirit-led man to recognize that what he was writing to them was the commandments of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 14.37. Inevitably, such writings making so awful a claim on their acceptance were received by the infant churches as of a quality equal with, with the old Bible placed alongside of its older books as an additional part of the law of God, and read as such in their meetings for worship, a practice which, moreover, was required by the apostles. 1 Thessalonians 5.27, Colossians 4.16, Revelation 1.3. In their apprehension, therefore, of the earliest churches, the scriptures were not as closed, but an increasing canon. Such they had been from the beginning, as they gradually grew in number from Moses to Malachi, and such they were to continue as long as there should remain among the churches men of God who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We say that this immediate placing of the new books, give, given the church under the seal of ap apostolic authority among the scriptures already established as such, was inevitable. It is also historically evinced from the very beginning. Thus the Apostle Peter, writing in AD 68, speaks of Paul's numerous letters not in contrast with the scriptures but as among the scriptures and in contrast with other scriptures 2 Peter 3 16. That is of course those of the Old Testament. In like manner the Apostle Paul combines as if it were the most natural thing in the world the book of Deuteronomy and the Gospel of Luke under the common head of scripture 1 Timothy 5 18. For the scripture said thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth the corn Deuteronomy 25 4 and the labor is worthy of his hire, Luke 10, 7. The line of such quotations is never broken in Christian literature. Polycarp in AD 115 unites the Psalms and Ephesians in on, on exactly the similar manner. In the sacred books, quote, as it is said, these scriptures, be ye angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So a few years later, the so-called second letter of Clement, after quoting Isaiah, adds, 
kept in 2.4, and another script, however, says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners, end of quote. Quoting from Matthew, a book which Barnabas, uh, circa 97 to 16 AD, had already adduced a scripture after this such quotations are common. What needs emphasis at present about these facts is that they obviously are not evidences of a gradually heightening estimate of the New Testament books originally received, originally received on a lower level and just beginning to be tentatively accounted scripture. They are conclusive evidence rather of the estimation of the New Testament books from the very beginning as scripture and of their, and of their attachment to scripture to other scriptures already in hand. The early Christians did not then first from a rival canon of a new books which came, sorry, the early Christians did not then first form a rival canon of a new books which came only gradually to be accounted as of equal divinity and authority with the old books. They received new books after new books from the apostolic circle as equal scripture with the old books and added them one by one to the collection of old books as additional scripture until at length the new books thus added were numerous enough to be looted upon as another section of scripture. The earliest name given to this section of scripture was framed as the model by the name by which we know as the Old Testament was then known. Just as it was called the law of the prophets of the Psalms or the Haggaiographer or more briefly the law of the prophets or even more briefly still the law. So the enlarged Bible was called the law of the prophets with the gospels and the apostles. So Clement of Alexandria, Strom, uh, 6, 11, 88, Tertullian, D, P, R, M, S, Man, 36. And most briefly, quote, the law and the gospel, so Claudius, Apollarius, and Irenaeus. While the new books apart were called the gospel and the apostles, or most briefly of all, the gospel, this earliest name for the new Bible with all that, that it involves as to its relation to the old and briefer Bible is traceable so far back as Ignatius in AD 115, who makes use of it repeatedly in 8 Ad Philad, uh, Smy, uh, 5 and S Smy, Smyrene 7. In one passage, he gives us a hint of the controversies which the enlarged Bible of the Christians aroused among the Judaizers in Philad 6. Quote, when I heard some sayings, he writes, unless I find it in the old books, I will not believe the gospel on my saying it is written. The answer, that is the question. To me, however, Jesus Christ is the old books, his cross and death and resurrection of faith, which is by him the undefiled old books by which I wish by your prayers to be justified. The priests indeed are good, but the high priest better. Here Ignatius, Ignatius appeals to the gospel as scripture, and the Judaizers object receiving from him the answers in effect, which Augustine afterwards formulated in the well-known saying that the New Testament lies hidden in the old, and the Old Testament is first made clear in the new. What we need now to observe, however, is that to Ignatius, the New Testament was not a different book from the Old Testament, but part of the one body of scripture with it, an accretion, so to speak, which had grown upon it. This is the testimony of all the early witnesses, even those which speak for the distinctly Jewish Christian church. For example, that curious Jewish Christian writing in the New Testament of the 12 patriarchs, Benai 11 tells us under the cover of an ex post facto prophecy that the work and the word of Paul, i.e. confessedly the book of Acts and Paul's epistles, shall be written in the holy books, i.e. as it understood by all made a part of the extant Bible. So even in the Talmud, in a scene intended to ridicule a bishop of the first century, he is represented as finding Galatians by sinking himself deeper into the same book which contained the law of Moses, uh, the Babel, uh, Shabbat 16 A and B. The details cannot be entered into here. Let it suffice to say that from the evidence of the fragments which alone have been preserved to us of the writings of Christians, that very early time it appeared that from the beginning of the second century, and that is from the end of the apostolic age, a collection, Ignatius, to Clement, of new books, Ignatius called the Gospel and Apostles, Ignatius of Martian was already a part of the oracles of God, Polycarp, Papius, Polycarp, Papius, Pap Papius, or Papius, Second Clement, or Scriptures, 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy, 2 Peter, Barnabas, Polycarp, 2 Clement, or the Holy Books, or Bible. In other words, 
uh, all these writers, Ignatius, uh, Martian the Heretic, Polycarp, Papias to Clement, all had an understanding of a canon by the use of these words, holy books, the scriptures, oracles of God, etc. That, that was me, not B.B. Warfield. The number of books, says Warfield, included in this added body of the New Testament books at the beginning of the second century cannot be satisfactorily determined by the evidence of these fragments alone. The section of it called the Gospel included Gospels written by the Apostles and their companions, Justin, which beyond legitimate questions were our four Gospels now received. The section called the Apostles contained the books of Acts, uh, the test 12 P-A-T-T, -T, whatever that means, the epistles of Paul, John, Peter and James. The evidence from various quarters is indeed enough to show that the collection in general use contained all the books which we at present receive, with the possible exception of Jude 2 and 3 John, Philemon. It is more natural to suppose that the failure of very early evidence for these brief booklets is due to their insignificant, insignificant size rather to their non-acceptance. He says, and it is more natural to suppose that the failure of very early evidence for these brief booklets is due to their insignificant size rather than the, to their non-acceptance. It is to be borne in mind, however, that the extent of the collection may have, and indeed is historically shown actually to have varied in different localities. The Bible was circulated only in hand copies, slowly and painfully made and incomplete copies obtained, say at Ephesus AD 68, would be likely to remain for many years the Bible of the church to which it was conveyed, and might indeed become the parent of other copies incomplete like itself, and thus the means of providing a whole district with incomplete Bibles. Thus when we inquire after the history of the New Testament canon, we need to distinguish such questions as these, when was the New Testament canon completed? When did any one church acquire a completed canon? When did the completed canon, the complete Bible, obtain universal circulation and acceptance? On what ground and evidence did the churches with incomplete Bibles accept the remaining books when they were made known to them? The canon of the New Testament was completed when the last authoritative book was given to any church by the Apostle, and that was when John wrote the, ap ap the Apocalypse about AD 98. Whether the Church of Ephesus, however, had completed canon when it received the uh, Apocalypse or not would depend on whether there was an epistle, say that of Jude, which had not yet reached it with authenticating proof of its apostolicity. There is room for historical investigation here. Certainly the whole canon was not universally received by the churches till somewhat later. The Latin Church of the 2nd and 3rd centuries did not quite know what to do with the epistle to Hebrews, the Syriac churches for some centuries may have lacked the lesser of Catholic epistles of Revelation. But from the time of Irenaeus down, the church at large had the whole canon as we now possess it. And though a section of the church may not yet have been satisfied of the apostolicity of a certain book, or of a certain books, and though afterwards doubts may have arisen in sections of the church as to the apostolicity of certain books, e.g. Revelation, Yet in no case was it more than a respectable minority of the church which was slow in receiving, or which came afterwards to doubt the credentials of any one, any of the books, than then as now constituted the canon of New Testament. Sorry. Yet in no case was it more than a respectable minority of the church which was slow in receiving, or which came afterwards to doubt the credentials of any of the books that then as now constituted the canon of the New Testament accepted by the church at large. And in every case, the principle on which a book was accepted or doubts against it laid aside was the historical tradition of apostolicity. Let it, however, be clearly understood that it was not exactly apostolic authorship which the estimation of the early churches constituted a book or portion of the canon. Apostolic authorship was indeed early confounded with canosity. It was doubt it was doubt as to the apostolic authorship of Hebrews in the West of James and Jude, apparently, which underlay the slowness of the inclusion of these books in the canon of certain churches. But from the beginning it was not so. The principle of canonicity was not apostolic authority uh, authorship, but imposition by the apostles as law. Hence, Tertullian's name for the canons is instrumentum, 
and he speaks of the old and new instrumentum and we would of the old and new testament that the apostles so imposed the old testament on the churches which they founded as the instrumentum or law and canon can be denied by none and imposing new books on the same churches by the same apostolic authority they did not confine themselves to books of their own composition is the gospel according to luke a man who was not an apostle which paul parallels in 1 timothy 5 18 with deuteronomy as equal to scripture with it and in the first extant quotation of a new testament book of scripture the gospels which constitute the first division of the new books the gospels and the apostles justin tells us were written by the apostles and their companions the authority of the apostles as by divine appointment founders of the church was embodied in whatever books they imposed on the church's law not merely in those they themselves had written the early churches in short received as we received into the new testament all the books historically evinced to them as given by the apostles of the churches as their code of law and we must not mistaken the historical evidences of the slow circulation and authentication of these books over the widely extended church evidence of slowness of the canonization of these books by the authority or taste of the church itself so you i know why like, reading it out is a bit tedious but you can go and read it yourself on www.bibleresearcher.com the formation of the canon of the new testament bb warfield 1892 from a scholar that uh, i greatly respect i'm going to make a couple of more videos now i'm going to do a couple of videos on scripture and then i'm going to make a a, a bible uh, do a bible study on scripture if you want to stick around i'm going to get a drink of water and i'll see you later on god bless you